Hey, welcome to In the Church with Ryan and Scott. We're glad you joined us today. I'm Ron Crispin. I'm the worship minister. And we've got some pretty exciting things that we've been thinking about. This is an opportunity now. If we're, we're wearing masks and stuff, I got to thinking we can lip sync really good. That might be our new worship style. But the other thing, you remember the drum shields? That has protected, by the way, all of the drummers from getting the coronavirus. We're going to put one around Scott because there's more than a six foot safety distance. Because if you've ever seen anybody spit so much. Just one of them spitting preachers, I suppose. <laughs> We're looking forward to a great service today and we're glad that you have joined us. And uh, remember that this is a time of worship and that even though you're sitting in your living room, most probably, or watching on your phones, that you would engage what God has for you today. And uh, let me just pray as we open this service today. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We pray that, Father, that your spirit would be felt not only here where we are recording this, but also, Lord, that it would be felt in the homes of every individual who tunes in today. And, Father, that your spirit would transcend time and space and come to us. Spirit, be near, we pray. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, during this time of being isolated, I have found that my in-laws have moved out to the farm. And we got together at the picnic shelter with all the family. And my 16-year-old son, he comes up and says, Dad, can we talk? And I'm like, yeah, I love that. You know, 16 year olds, they generally don't talk. I tripped off every word that he said. He shared his life, he shared his problems, his struggles. And that's what our Heavenly Father wants to do with us. He wants to be in communion with us, He wants our worship. That's what we were created for. So I ask that today, even though you may be sitting on a couch, sitting somewhere watching this on your phone, that you know that Christ wants to be in communion with you. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to hear your problems and your struggles as you go through life because we all have them. So I ask today that you just join in and you worship with us. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion. You are my hiding place.
and I'm set on you. And you made me here today with mercies that I know. All my fears and doubts, they can all come true because they can't stay long.
Today, we're looking deep into the scriptures. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 through 13. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 through 13. And uh, if you don't know me, maybe you've never heard me before. Maybe this is the first time you've ever tuned in. I'm going to tell you that today, I am scum. That's just who I am. Let me tell you why I believe that. You know, in my household, uh, I am totally against name calling. Uh, you know, the latest one that I have to correct is my youngest son, who is a little over two years old. His name is Wilson. And he uh, has this way that when he gets upset and angry and mad at one of his three siblings, he will often look at them and say, bad baby, you're a bad baby. And that's against the rules in my household, even though it is quite hilarious to be able to listen to a two-year-old say, you're a bad baby. Quite funny. Nonetheless, in my household, it is against the rules to say names against people. In fact, uh, the reality of this goes so deep that in Corinthians, Paul kind of takes this reality that we are scum. He calls the Christian community basically scum which I don't really know how you, maybe you've called, uh, been called or called someone scum before. And uh, to be able to contextualize that or scum bag, which would be maybe just the stuff that builds up in the corner of your shower, uh, it doesn't feel very good to be called a name. And if you were to take uh, that particular name, scum, and then make it synonymous with who you are, there would be quite a frustration. And so Paul kind of goes against the rules of my home, and he begins calling the Christian community scum. And let's go into the word so we can better understand this. 
1 Corinthians 4, verse 10 through 13 says this, We are fools for Christ, but who, but you are so wise in Christ. He's kind of a polemic. He's speaking to uh, uh, these Corinthians. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty, and we are in rags, and we are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our hands. And when we are cursed, we bless. And when we have been persecuted, we endure it. And when we are slandered, we answer kindly. And here he says it. We have become the scum of the earth. The garbage of the world right up into this moment. The interesting thing about this is that Paul uses the word scum as more meaning than just the stuff in the corner of your shower. The Greeks used the terminology to apply the term scum, which in the Greek is perikarthama, is to the victims who were sacrificed in pagan religions on the outbreak of a pestilence or other calamity. They might be offered as sacrifices to make amends for the state of that particular pestilence in the land. Um, those people who were sacrificed were called scum. Metaphorically speaking, these people were like the scum of the earth. They were refuse, the abject and most despicable people of the world. And these people were not used as sacrifices to appease the gods necessarily in Greek or Roman mythology or religions, pagan religions. They were so bad, they were such terrible people that they society just wanted to get rid of them and so they were uh, pretty much excommunicated. They were removed from society as sacrifices so that they were basically the source of what was making everything bad. And so the list that Paul uses is a self-description of the apostles himself, and it is a response to those Christians uh, who have not embraced the lifestyle of what it means to be a true Christian. You see, the list goes like this. They're fools for Christ. They're weak, dishonored, hungry, thirsty, in rags, brutally treated, homeless, hardworking, cursed, persecuted, slandered, the scum of the earth, and garbage of the world. Now, when I was a kid, I remember, uh, you know, there was a traveling salesman that came to my house, and he was selling encyclopedias. And as he came to our home, he decided to uh, that we were the prime target. There were three kids in my household, and we were all school-aged, so he thought this is perfect. He would sell his encyclopedias to us. And he you know, went through the list of, of the great things to this volume of encyclopedias. Now, little did we know that this was right before, within one or two years of the advent of the Internet, and all this information will be posted on the Internet for free. But either way, we bought the, the encyclopedia set, and he sold it to it as this, that we would get a better education, we would have smarter children in our house, there would be quick references for things that we didn't know how to answer. Either way, we sat down and it, uh, that set sat on the shelf most of the time and didn't get used. You know, one of the things that he didn't list about knowledge in encyclopedia is, is that you have to actually sit down and do the work and use the encyclopedia by reading and studying in it. Not like the internet where we can just simply ask Siri and she tells us everything we want to know at any given time. And so if I came to you and I listed the benefits of Christianity, much like those encyclopedias were listed, um, I think it would end up not as a list of all of the wonderful things that you think about when you think of the Christian life, but it would end up as a list much like Paul's. We often log the benefits of Christianity around, saying that we are becoming like Jesus. But then we forget sometimes the picture of who Jesus really was. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah paints him as a man of sorrows and suffering and acquainted with grief. And, and I'm questioning if the fact that if you think about Christian life, really, do you think about the scummy side of what Christianity has to offer? And so to be honest with you, human life is filled with all of those hardships, all of the suffering that humanity has to offer. It's just a matter of question of whether or not you want to go through that on your own, apart from Christ, or you want to do those things and suffer with Christ. I would personally rather have Jesus. And so 
If you were to imagine for a moment that if I were rewriting the brochure uh, for New Harvest that we give all new visitors, instead of you know, telling all the benefits of what New Harvest has to offer as a uh, blessed community of Christian believers, what if I just simply listed the, the list that Paul gives us in verse 13? You know, it could read something like this. It, Welcome to New Harvest. We're scum here. So are you. Worship with us on 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Doesn't sound like the most appealing uh, particular list to be part of, but that is at the essence of who we are. And to be quite honest with you, I'd rather be described like Paul's scummy description and list than be devoid of the peace of God. I'd rather be scum than to have the fear of judgment of sin and all the wrongdoing I have done in my life. To me, I think that Paul is saying, you think that this list sounds bad. I'd rather be considered a fool than embrace life without Jesus. Even if having Jesus means to be weak, and means to be cursed and persecuted and slandered and generally the scum of the earth, I would rather have Jesus. And so in 1922, there was a poem penned by Ray Miller. And this, the name of the poem was, I'd rather have Jesus. The lyrics go like this. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. Yes, I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands. Than to be the king of the best domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. This particular poem was left on the piano of a young man by his mother who wanted him to change the direction of his life. This young man uh, was a skilled musician, well educated in the area, and was offered a career with NBC. However, years later, he decided to choose a different path rather than the spotlight of mainstream media. The young man was named George Beverly Shea. Many of you know him as Billy Graham's worship leader. And he traveled the world with Billy Graham singing this song, I'd Rather Have Jesus, because he was so deeply affected by the story. The choice of life is often between two kinds of riches. One type of rich, uh, riches are the temporary. The other kind is the eternal, the lasting uh, e Basically, the uh, delayed gratification of eternity and all of the riches that Jesus gives us in eternity. Um, I've referenced this before, but there is a study that was done with adolescents, with youth and children years ago, and it had to do with delayed gratification and marshmallows. And so the uh, people came into the room with a child and they said, I, you can have this one marshmallow now. However, if when I leave the room uh, and come back, and if you haven't eaten that first marshmallow, uh, you can have two marshmallows. And so they did this study and they found out as they tracked these children that the ones who were able to resist the temptation to eat the first marshmallow and delayed their gratification so that they could have two marshmallows at the end when the person returned, that they followed them over a lifetime and found out that they had better family relationships, more stable emotional character, that they had better jobs, they earned more money. All of these things were attributed to the fact that these young children were able to delay their gratification and wait for the better thing to come at the end. And the essence of this is in Christian life, that true riches cannot be found in this life. The true riches are held for us in eternity. I'd rather have Jesus. The issue Paul is taking here is about self-sufficiency versus absolute and utter dependence on Jesus. And so, you know, the truth is, is that if we were to contextualize this in, within modern church, you can drive around the United States and uh, really worldwide is probably even better within the context of the historical church and see that there are people and churches all over the world that have once been glorious and filled with wonderful, godly Christian people who later on, now those churches, uh, 
um, are beginning to be dilapidated, the grass is high, the roof is leaking, the drywall is peeling, the paint is going bad. Things in these churches have drastically changed. They went from full to empty. Because somewhere, at some point, though there are a myriad of reasons why those churches are empty today, the real truth of it is, is that they became self-sufficient somewhere. And they refused a dependency on God. And that was what met their demise. Maybe you've heard this in our own English language. It actually supports what Paul is talking about in the necessity of the Corinthian church's understanding. It's this terminology like the phrase, I'll knock you down to size. Or maybe another one is, I'll put you in your place. Or another one like this, you're getting a little bit too big for your britches. It seems like in human nature that we have this tendency to get a little bit successful in life, for things to go well for us, and then we think we've got everything figured out. And then we forget and must realize that we are in desperate need of being corrected to be kept humble before Christ, before things get in a much worse direction. And I think if we really were to embrace what Paul is talking about, that your disposition and your, you, your viewpoint in life would drastically change, and basically you would come out of the other side looking like everything in life, whether good or bad, whether pain or sorrow, with, with or without joy or ecstatic experience, whatever comes your way is an absolute gift from God, 100%. The real truth is, is that if we are really to deeply acknowledge what Paul is trying to say to us is this, that you have no room to be proud about anything in your life. Because anything you have or that you have done well was only Christ working in you to accomplish those things in the first place. There's another old song that I'm reminded of by Dottie Rambo. And the song basically goes like this, that... Lord, remember I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. You know, I think that there's these moments in time where we just have to stop and realize that we are totally ineffectual at anything in life. I mean, if you were really to just zoom out and think about your life and what you can accomplish, the grim reality of that is, is that we can accomplish nothing that will last apart from Jesus. We want to have an eternal impact, an impact that lives beyond our physical bodies, beyond our temporary time here on earth. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to rely on the only eternal one to begin with. Now, maybe it's because um, we've just come through the Easter season and I know that it is as I contemplate this and think about it, but for some reason, Jesus' interrogation before Pontius Pilate just really grips my mind lately. And something particular sticks out to me. One is, is that we have privy to the fact that Jesus had this private conversation with Pilate in the first place. I mean, you have to wonder, there's no way, basically, uh, that any of the disciples were able to hear that conversation with Jesus. Why was it recorded in the gospel stories? I think, personally, that it must have been disseminated to the disciples by Jesus after the resurrection. They probably wanted to know, what was it like inside Pilate, Pontius Pilate's household? What was it like inside the, the praetorium of Pontius Pilate? Because basically, no Jew had ever been in there because it was an unclean place of the Gentiles, unless you were a criminal, that is. And so in the midst of this, I think about it. And so Paul, I mean, Pilate basically says to him, don't you know that I have the power to either release you, Jesus, or to crucify you? And then Jesus looks at Pilate and replies like this, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. And if you were to really just kind of stop and think about this very thought, would you have anything in this life at all if Jesus had given it to you by his grace? 
Would you have a house, a roof over your head, money in your pocket? Would you have food in your belly? Would you have anything in this life at all if it had not been given to you by the Father who possesses all things? What is Paul saying here is, is that you're scum. Without Christ, you are the scum of the earth. And we do well to remember who we truly are and that we only have an identity in Christ. Now, though Paul uses these terms uh, very widely, he doesn't use them without good reason. He reminds us who we are without Christ. But with Christ, we remember the word scum, really. But with Christ, we're God's scum. And he changes us. And transforms us. And then the reality that we experience with life in Christ is, is that Jesus loves us so much. And Jesus is the lover of our souls.